So uh, here's our slide set uh, with uh, questions and answers of the second theoretical exercise. So, whoops, this has shifted a bit well, for whatever reason. Uh, so the first question was uh, concerned with Unix processes. So uh, this asks about the init process specifically, and we've seen that, yeah, with uh, many Unix systems, init is the process which starts all the other Unix processes. So it sits at the top of the Unix process hierarchy, it has process ID one. And uh, the first question was to describe the two cases in which a process a ch is a child process of init. So the first one is the obvious case. So a process is directly created by init using fork. So when init starts up, it reads a special configuration file, usually the etc init tab. So a table for init that tells init which processes to start. And init tab contains a number of processes that are to be started at system startup. In addition, init can also create new processes while it is running. So init can, for example, uh, figure out that there is a new connection to a serial line. This has happened pretty uh, regularly when you had computers that had no fixed internet connection, but dial up connections. So we really needed a modem and a telephone line. And whenever there was a new incoming uh, modem connection, actually init spawned a new Getty process, which then enabled the user who dialed into your Unix machine using his modem at home uh, to actually log into your computer. So that's the regular case. Of course, the process is directly created by init. That's how init should work. And uh, we've also seen in our lecture that uh, init has a second function. So because it's the grand, grand, grandfather or whatever of all the other processes in our system, it can take over the role to, uh, of just adopting orphaned processes. So if a process like Firefox here in our example was started using a shell bash and the shell crashes or is killed or somehow exits, then we still want to have a connection here. So we still want to be able to control Firefox. And uh, what happens in this case is that the parent process idea of Firefox is reset. So originally this would have pointed to the process ID of our bash shell here. And if bash is no longer in the system, then the parent process ID of Firefox is rerouted to point to our init process. So to process ID one. So init takes over the role of the parent. It's, it's a foster parent, so to say. And uh, there was one question on Piazza on this, like, uh, why, why are we doing it this way? I think if I remember it correctly, and why uh, aren't we attaching Firefox to the next process further up in the hierarchy, which would be a login or a Getty. Now, the problem is that Unix actually doesn't store the information somewhere centrally about the whole process hierarchy. Uh, it only stores a process ID for each process and its parent process ID. So it would need to be able to reconstruct. And of course, in a real Unix system, these uh, graphs can look much more complicated. So it would need to be able to reconstruct all this hierarchy. And this doesn't really help us a lot because maybe login wouldn't actually pre be prepared to handle Firefox uh, because it doesn't, for example, execute a wait system call for its children. So uh, essentially init is prepared for handling these orphan children because it's a special use case for init. And that's the reason why we actually attach all the orphan processes to init and init can then, for example, when these processes terminate, can then execute a wait for these processes that's got attached to it, which means they don't end up as zombies in our system. Okay, there's a question in the chat, I think. Yes, uh, well, I'll answer this later. <laughs> okay, that's not directly related to this question. All right, so uh, we've seen and it takes over the role of the parent. And if you look at the lecture slides, I added this, uh, yeah, thinking uh, emoticon here, like what happens if in it itself exits? 
And that's an interesting question. I don't know if any of you have tried to kill the init process. And well, uh, at least some earlier Linux uh, software authors thought of this problem. So if you look at a man page for the kill system call in an older Linux system, the, uh, somehow this text has disappeared from recent systems, I just checked. And this older Linux man page stated, the only signals that can be sent to process ID one, the init process, are those for which init has explicitly installed a so-called signal handler. We'll see what signal handlers are in a later lecture. So essentially uh, you can only send signals for which init is prepared to handle them. So especially signals that would just kill the init process like uh, signal nine, which is a sick kill signal uh, that you can send to a process uh, is specifically ignored. So the kernel doesn't send these signals to terminate in it to init. Uh, and this is done as the man page states to assure the system is not brought down accidentally. So you could try to guess what happens uh, when we could kill in it and on earlier Unix systems like old system five machines, you could actually do this. So when you actually accidentally or intentionally killed in it actually you would do a hard shutdown of the system. Uh, which means your system would just stop running, all processes would be killed. And well, you wouldn't actually uh, write back your information to disk, you wouldn't synchronize anything. So it would be more or less the same as just flipping the power switch, which is never a good idea when you have a Unix system, because in order to ensure data consistency, you should really try to do a safe shutdown of the system. In some systems, uh, in it is prepared for this. So in some other systems, older systems, if you try to kill in it, it would actually initiate a shutdown sequence. And this was in some very early systems, the actually the official way to bring down the system to shut it down to kill in it. But in modern systems, this is usually prohibited because of the number of things that can go wrong. So this of course is additional information that wasn't part of the original question. All right. So part B of that question was uh, to describe the function of the exact VP function in your own words. So our hint was read the man page. So I really wanted you to read a man page. And we've seen in the lecture that there's quite a number of different exec functions, uh, which are part of the C library. And we've also seen they all ultimately use one system call. And this system call is called exec VE. So it's a system call because it's described in section two of the manual, whereas all the other exec functions, you can find them in section three of the manual. So section two is system calls, section three is libc C library functions. So all of them ultimately use the system call exec VE to, well, to, to well, create a new process is a, is a bit misleading here, uh, as I just, noticed because the process of course is created by fork so it just replaces the process image by this new program here but some of these exec functions are more convenient to use and that's why we have these separate so if you use the man page for exec vp you see a, a whole couple of other exec style functions listed and depending on the use case they are less overhead for you to write so exec VP specifically allows you to pass command line arguments as parameters. So when uh, we look at the prototype for exec VP, we see it takes a const character pointer, so a constant string for the file to execute. And it takes an array of arguments here, uh, argument strings here, which describe pot uh, potentially uh, parameters for the command line. But of course we can also call a command without giving any executable parameters. And exec VP, that's why this P here is for path, uh, means uh, that the executable file is not only searched, for example, in the current directory or somewhere, but it's searched in the search path that you specify in your shell. And you do this by setting the path variable. It's an environment variable in the shell. And if this is not set, usually the Unix system assumes some default search path, which exactly it is depends on your system. So the name of exec VP comes from, well, execute something. V stands for passing these argument values. That's the V, so an array of string arguments. And P stands for search in the path. So that's one of the convenience functions. And as you saw in the man page, there are a number of others. So 
How do you use ExecVP just for completeness sake? So uh, we've seen uh, there are essentially two parameters to ExecVP. The first one is the command to execute like ls in this case here. And then we can pass an argument list. Now we've seen an argument list is an array of strings. So an array of character pointers. And we need to indicate the end of this list to our system somehow. So the last argument in this array always has to be the constant null, which is just a null pointer which means uh, it's a string that points to null. So essentially it's not a valid string. And one thing, the thing we have to care about is to enable our Unix system to execute or to pass the parameters correctly. We need to remember in Unix, the zeros element of the list that we pass. This is actually the command line, uh, command name itself. We could call it differently actually. So we don't need to call it ls because the actual command executed is given as the first parameter. We just give it in addition, again, as this zeroth parameter of our argument list, because this is a Unix convention. So the real parameters we pass to ls start at array element number one, and this would be dash l here. So for ls, that would mean we have a long style output, not only file names, but also file size, modification date, owner, group, and access permissions here. So that's what you have to take care of when you use execvp to actually include the command name itself as the zeros parameter in the argument list. Otherwise, well, you'll get a pretty unexpected output, I'd say. All right. Um, part C of that question was uh, concerned with a Unix pipeline. So the question was given this command here, ls pipe grep dash C, dot pdf uh, to explain the output of the following command in your own words and if you have tried this and the hint was that you should probably try it in a directory that has at least one pdf file now that was probably a bit obvious and uh, for example i tried it and it just gave me the output three so what's going on there so we know if we type the ls pro uh, command on its own on the command line it just lists the contents of the current directory and without any options to ls, it just lists the contents of the current directory, one file name per line or one line per file name. Um, if you tried it on, on some Unix systems, you might notice that ls actually prints more than one file name per line. This only happens when ls directly outputs to the terminal. So this is a bit of a nasty detail here. So when ls actually outputs to a pipeline, so not to a terminal. So it can distinguish between the cases. It always outputs one file name per line. So this information is then passed to our grep command. So grep is the command that can filter input. So it can remove lines from the input or it can even uh, remove partial things from the input. And this happens according to a pattern. So grep searches for this pattern passed here as a parameter. So a pattern that is, consists of dot PDF. And now we added a parameter dash C here. And if we look at the grep man page again, we see dash C only a count of selected lines is written to the standard output. So essentially what happens here, grep always goes line by line. It removes all the line from our input that don't contain the character sequence dot PDF. So all the file names that have, don't have dot PDF in their name. And then it counts the remaining lines. So all of the lines which have .pdf in them. So this is the number of PDF files in your current directory. And this is essentially just a demonstration of the typical approach to Unix. Like we want to do one thing per command and do it well. So we didn't add an option to ls like ls count the number of PDFs because that would just bloat ls. But we just pass this information to a separate program, which then can do this counting, for example, of uh, occurrences of this pattern in the file for any text file that you can have, no matter if it's the output of ls or a file you wrote or something else. So the output of this file just prints the number of PDF files in your current directory. So uh, the second part of the question was which data is transferred through the pipeline and what there was a typo operation. I typed operating. I don't know if this happens to me several times. Maybe also you notice this on the slides. Uh, so sorry for that typo. So which operation does grep perform here? I told you a bit about this before. 
So essentially, what's important was the question what's actually passed from ls so ls prints to its standard output this is redirected to the pipe and the other side of the pipe is then input as standard input to grab so it's just text so the output of ls as we've seen is just a list of file names uh, one file name per line and lines are separated usually in unix by a new line character this has the hexadecimal value uh, OXA, so decimal 10 as the ASCII encoding, or you would write it as backslash n in a printf format string. So what happens here is ls simply gives a, yeah, a list of file names, each on a line, and grep then takes line by line and tries to match the pattern here. And that's why we get the number of PDF files as the output. All right. So the second question was concerned with the fork system call, and we gave a pretty nasty line of C code here with a warning, do not try to execute it. For semicolon, semicolon, fork. So a for loop in C usually has a number of parameters here before and in between the semicolons and after the semicolon indicating conditions. So for example, the initial counter for a loop, so which variable should be a loop counter, which uh, condition should be fulfilled uh, for the loop to terminate, and what happens in every iteration. So for example, incrementing our loop counter here. Now, if we don't give anything, this is equivalent to an endless loop. So it's a while loop without any parameters inside of the brackets here, that would be the same, or while one would be the same uh, as this for semicolon semicolon here. Uh, so essentially it's a never ending loop and we always execute fork in that loop. So when we first execute our first iteration in our C program, well, we have the parent process and we have just created a child process. So now both processes continue to run. So when we're in the next iteration of that loop, our parent process creates its second child, while our, our child process also continues to run through the fork loop, uh, to the for loop, of course, and uh, generates a child of its own. Well, and that just continues. So our tree of process hierarchy gets broader and deeper. So in iteration number three, our parent creates a new child process. Our first child creates a new child process. Our second child creates a new child process. And this grandchild of the original parent process also creates a child process. Well, and uh, as you can see, this can get pretty big and uh, we've seen fork is optimized for speed so it can create a large number of processes very quickly so if you try this well what happens uh well uh describe the problems that can occur so we've seen it with each iteration of the loop the number of newly created processes increases and this not only linearly increases but well it's probably an exponential growth uh, now we've seen that usually if we only create copies of processes using fork and do not use exec or do not write to any of the data uh, segments of the parent or child process, well, we all use the same memory segments. So we don't use more memory for the process code and data segments themselves, but due to this copy on write that happens, but we still need to allocate memory for the page tables of that process of our new process since we need a new page table mapping to the original physical pages of that original grand 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 grandparent process uh, and this means even if we don't use any memory for text and data segments for our new processes we still need your memory for the page tables and also for the operating system internal process table entries so eventually since we uh, uh, create so many new processes the operating system will run out of resources. And I haven't tried this on a modern Unix system. I probably should set up a VM to do this, but the possibility that it will simply crash because nobody handled that problem is pretty high. Well, so don't try this at home unless you have a virtual machine, you can just reboot. So uh, the final question here was trying to find a way to avoid this problem in Unix without changing the prog program. So can we somehow restrict this endless creation of new processes? 
And I wonder if any uh, of you actually found something on this. So uh, if we look at the limits for the number of processes, you can find something that the number of maximum, the maximum number of processes in Linux, for example, is defined in a file in the so-called PROC file system. So PROC is a virtual file system, which provides, well, some internal system information like running processes and system parameters as text files, but they're not somewhere on disk. It's just virtual. So the kernel again creates an illusion. And this illusion means that uh, the some of the internal kernel information is provided in the form that you as a user see as a text file. So in PROC, there's a subdirectory called sys for system, and then there's kernel in there, and there's a kernel parameter called pit max, so the maximum process ID, so the maximum number of processes. As you see, this is somehow around 4.2 billion processes. That's a whole lot. So especially if you like have four gigabyte of RAM, then you have one byte left for each of the processes uh, in your memory. Oh no, sorry, it's four million processes. Ah, read this wrong. So essentially, if you have a four gigabyte machine, you have one kilobyte for each process. That still isn't very much. And most systems really don't restrict this very much, especially the number of processes a user is allowed to create. But there's ways to check and set the current limits a user is allowed to use. And there's a U limit command you can use on the shell, for example, giving the parameter dot dash A, so you see all the limits for a user, or you can only use dash U to only print the number of allowed processes. And for example, you could call U limit dash A, and then uh, there are some lines of output, and it tells you max user processes here is around 250,000. This is still a large number. So what you could try is to experiment with uh, setting the U limit, for example, to 100 processes, and then try this fork. But depending on your Unix system, something may go wrong. It might still crash because some systems, I'm, I'm for example, not sure if, if the Windows subsystem for Linux actually honors this information. So uh, still, I'd advise you to be careful with this. So this was uh, the uh, second three-year exercise. So we're digging a bit into processes here and into process behavior on Linux. Also, you may have noticed the uh, lecture seven is out and I hope to provide you with lecture eight uh, this evening. So lecture eight uh, will uh, take a look at uh, programs and processes in the Unix context in more detail. And what we will provide there is something that's maybe a bit unusual because we have a large number of lecture slots. Um, I decided to add some additional information which is not relevant to the exam. So some of these lectures and we'll mark them explicitly are not relevant knowledge for the exam, but still I hope interesting. Uh, so in the lecture that's going to be published today, we'll discuss the structure of executable files. So the ELF files on Linux, how they are loaded, how they are linked statically and dynamically, and what happens uh, during their execution. So I hope some of you might find this interesting as additional information, but I don't want to push too much knowledge to just learn by heart into your heads. So essentially uh, today's uh, lecture, so the one uh, published this evening, uh, will not be part of the knowledge that you're required to know, but I hope you still find it interesting. All right, that's all from